All right. Uh, thank you for waking up from your taco-induced slumber to uh, come and hang out and listen to me talk about classic tools for the cloud native era. This is me. Uh, that's a better picture of me than in real life, but that's what Photoshop can do. Uh, I'm CTO at a company called Puppet. Uh, we do infrastructure management software. I've been there for like eight years. Um, when we started it, it was pretty tiny, and now it's it's a pretty big deal and global, and it's kind of all over the place, um, which is good. So you can hit me up on Twitter. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. So if you have any complaints or you want to file bugs or something like that, that's probably not the ideal place to do it, but it's cool because it'll at least still get to me. All right. So I want to start this off, even though I made fun of people uh, coming out of a nap, I wanted to start this off by uh, proclaiming that uh, I just feel tired. I feel tired whenever I come to events like this. Um, and I think I find that I get really fatigued from the pace of all the new stuff that continues to come out. So there's, you know, I don't even know how many new things are probably gonna be announced over the next week. Uh, but it's probably going to be like a ton of them and probably by the end of the week a huge percentage of the audience is going to be experiencing some combination of like oh yeah I knew that was coming and that's really cool to oh I had no idea that thing existed that's interesting I don't know what I'm going to do with it to I had no idea that was coming and now I have some serious like FOMO like fear of missing out like should I have known about that should I be including this in the stuff that I do. So I think I find that this manifests itself in a couple of different ways. The way I think about it as an architect is that, you know, there are more ways than ever to build and architect systems out there. And you've seen probably a bunch of them today and yesterday if you went through a bunch of the talks already, right? Like people talking about uh, what kind of different mix and match particular combination of things that they use in order to build whatever application or infrastructure that they've got. So that's the world that I tend to live in, both internally to the company that I run, like my own engineering teams, as well as externally. I'm in the uh, good slash bad, depending on your perspective, uh, position of running a software company that does infrastructure software, but we actually make money. We've been doing it for a really long time, and we're sort of globally expanded and globally recognized. So that has a double-edged sword. Number one is I don't really have to talk that often to convince people of like who we are and why would you even be talking to me because generally everybody understands what Puppet is. The flip side though is I find that increasingly as the years have gone by, I find myself in more and more conversations with folks where they are not on the bleeding edge, to put it pretty kindly, right? They're pretty basic in terms of what they do with infrastructure. And sometimes I think it's easy within sort of the cloud native bubble to forget that for every one person that's doing, I don't know, distributed tracing, there's like probably, uh, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say there's 100,000 people using tail and grep. And for each one of those, there's probably another 100,000 that are literally clicking around in Windows Event Viewer. So that's the world that I live in because that's the majority of infrastructure I think that exists out there in the wild. Um, and I try to be very sympathetic with what I think an end user in that environment would want. So in this world where you know everything is crazy, there's constantly new technology, what it even means to be cloud native in 2019 is probably very different than what someone that was bleeding edge thought was cloud native in 2017, even though it's only been two years. So I like to mentally ground myself. And the way I like to mentally ground myself when I approach a new system, I was thinking about it. Like, what do I do? If I sit down, or I have engineers that work for me that sit down, it's a completely foreign system, I don't really know what the hell is going on, I get a shell. The first thing I type is LS. And I think it's important to think about this. I don't know how many people wax poetic about LS, <laughs> but I will absolutely wax poetic about LS. It lists stuff. It's two letters. It's very powerful. But I think the reason why it's powerful isn't necessarily what it does, like it literally lists files. I think the interesting thing about it is that it gives you in just two characters and then an enter key, you instantly get a lot of interesting things. You get some situational awareness of like, what am I even looking at? What kind of system is this? What's there? You can start exploring stuff. You can see what's around. It's a very powerful way of doing it, so much so that I think my muscle memory, if I just open up a terminal window and it's blank, one of the first things I do is just type ls and hit enter. Like, I don't know, everyone here probably has a filler command that you just type at a terminal. Like, mine are ls and clear. I don't know why. Like, <laughs> does, that, does that resonate with anybody else in here? Okay, I got a lot of 
So Ellis is a big deal. So I started thinking, uh, what is the cloud native version of LS? Exactly. <laughs> so all those like really pleasant properties one would get from just like something super basic, like what is what is the what is the equivalent of that in the modern world? So let's tell, let's go through some examples. Let's say I would like to uh, get all my Docker containers, or uh, sorry, my Mirantis Enterprise Container Platform uh, <laughs> containers now that they've been acquired. So what's the command to do this? Yes. Docker PS, if I want all of them, whether they're running or not, okay. Let's say I want to list all the volumes that I have in Docker. Does anyone know that one? Volumes LS, so very close. Why is it LS and the other one is PS? I don't know, I'm sure there's good reasons, but you're already scratching your heads what the right commands are, right? Okay, pods, probably everybody knows, so that's not gonna be a surprise. If I wanna get them across all the namespaces, that's what I would do. Uh, so let's go beyond just what like Kubernetes would do and start thinking about other things that are super common in a cloud native architecture. Um, how would I list the objects in an S3 bucket? It's like AWS S3 get buckets or something like that. Close, S3 LS. So some symmetry with Docker volume, but not with Docker container listing. How about, I wanna list my compute instances in GCP. Totally different tool you have to use this time, gcloud, uh, which by the way has its own weird internal package manager, which is totally orthogonal to like the host one, which I find kind of strange and infuriating. Um, but that's how I get it. So instead of ls or ps, it's list. Oh, I really like this one. Uh, so ec2, like the king of running stuff in the cloud. I want to do something basic like just list the IDs of my ec2 instances. Does anybody know this one? Exactly. Do you know what the query is? Give me 10 minutes in Google. <laughs> All right. Well, it, it just rolls off the tongue, really. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's just that simple. Isn't that awesome? In you know, 2019, cloud native, you could just fire up a terminal window, type that in as part of your muscle memory. I do that so you should just endorse me for that on, on LinkedIn. Um, <laughs> that really, it should be a skill. It should be a skill. Okay, so that's just listing stuff, and hopefully you've got you, hopefully have at least teased out the idea that a similar concept is radically different uh, depending on the target you're actually worrying about and the kind of resource that you're caring about. Even though ultimately all you want to do is list things. Um, so what if I want to read things? So listing, okay. Now reading, I think, starts to become a little bit more interesting. So if I want to read the content of a Google Compu a GCP object in object storage that's not actually done through gcloud. You need a separate command, gsutil, which is a Python program. Uh, so you, hopefully you have that running on your system. And then you have to know the URL, like what bucket it's in, uh, and then you know, kind of the path inside of it. So, okay. Um, what if I just want to get the output for a compute instance? Like it's running, I just want to see what it's doing. Again, that's totally different. Uh, I have to get serial port output, which I guess kind of makes sense. It's a serial, I don't know, of all the things that still have longevity, like serial port and like fax, <laughs> like those things are interesting, but what is dead will never die. Um, EC2 console output, not as insane as, as the uh, listing, oddly. I can get the output easier than I can actually list the things I would need to get the output from. But just imagine if I wanted to get my instances and then get the output for each one. Like ls pipe to cat or something. Like the equivalent of that is like 400 lines long and is totally insane. And everyone should probably hate themselves if you have to type that a lot. Um, S3 object content. I had to do this literally the other day because we had a bunch of stuff in S3. And it took me a really depressingly long time to actually figure this out if I wanted to do the equivalent of a cat. Uh, you basically end up having to do get object and then you go into the bucket, you specify the key, and that goes into a file that you then cat out because um, it reads it from standard input and then you have to obliterate the file if you want to just temporarily display it on the screen. So you actually have to download it. Yeah, you have to download it which is, you know, it's like annoying. <laughs> it's really what I'm trying to say. So let's think about something a little bit more interesting. Like what if I actually wanted to uh, read stuff from inside the file system of a running Docker container? 
Like, how would I do that in a generic way? Like, I actually thought about this a lot, and I don't know what the right answer to this is. Because you could shell into it. You could do like a Docker exec. But that depends on what if it's a scratch container that doesn't have a shell environment? What if you don't have all the tools that you need inside of there? What if could you mount the volume separately? Like, how does that work? Like, is that translatable? And again, that's like six different commands you'd have to figure out just in order to, fi just in order to introspect something that seems like it should be pretty basic, right? You just mount, and then you do grab the instance ID. Yeah. And then you go inside. Yeah, so you're starting to get the idea. OK, so now we're going to go into what I would say is uh, peak level craziness, as far as I'm concerned. I had this problem, again, this was a, a couple of weeks ago, where I have a bunch of different teams uh, that work for me, and they're all doing different applications on you know, some of its Docker stuff, some of it's running in this cloud, some of it's running on this other cloud, some of it's VMs, some of it's containers, some of it's like Kubernetes, who knows. Uh, but there are plenty of times when I just want to filter it based on who owns it. Right? So I know what team is associated with some of these resources. So if I want to find Docker containers by their owner, I could do Docker PS and I could filter it. So that's, that's, that's not too bad. Uh, if I wanted to find Kubernetes pods by owner, I could just use a selector and then figure out who the owner is. So that's not bad either. Uh, if I want to do that on GCP, uh, I would have to filter. And notice for every filter criteria, it's a slightly different hard-coded string that you would need to use. Um, if I wanted to do this on EC2, as one could possibly, as one could imagine, there's a theme with the AWS command line I'm trying to go for here, which is like they really need to take some of Jeff Bezos' like $100 billion and hire like a user experience person. <laughs> um, I'll do it for just like $1 billion. Like if they, you know, it's basically nothing to them. Um, so this is confusing, but you have to do it. Yeah, they have their own sort of uh, like sort of sub like their query language is yeah, is J is JQ esque. It's I all guess. JSON guess. Yeah. JSON yeah, that's it. Q control has the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. It's like you know their spiritual equivalent of like a Go format you know string on a command line, um, but that's like another sub language you now need to know in addition to the shell environment itself, which is kind of crazy. Uh, so my claim here is that everything is confusing, uh, everything is bespoke, everything is vendor specific, and nothing is really standardized. Um, and I think it's interesting to contrast this. Like, what, how would the world be if, if I plugged in like a flash drive into my system and I wanted to list the files on it? It was like, oh, sorry, you can't use GNU LS. You actually need to use San, like SanDisk's branded file management command line SDK. Like that would be idiotic, and we would all flip a table. Like and it's, it's exactly like cameras, and it's infuriating for all the same reasons, right? Like, why can't this thing be? Why can't these basic operations be standardized? And listing and things like that that I just showed, you know, that's not even the complete list of what I would consider to be like ops 101 for anything. Like, what if I just want to get like the running log output for a thing? Right, like maybe that's SQS or some other kind of queuing service. Like, I, you know, why can't? What's the procedure for getting logs? Like, can I just tail them? Do I need to go to CloudTrail? Do I need to go to XYZ? How do I get metadata for all these things? Which seems like that should be a pretty simple operation. How do I run a command? I could run something in the context of a Docker container or a Kubernetes pod. I could run a SQL query against an RDS instance, but they're all kind of different invocations of these things. So this brings me all the way back to LS. So LS is like the Unix standard way of listing stuff. But what about all those other cases that I mentioned? You know, I think there's complement, you know, there's sort of like the, the basic tools that people would think about when interacting with the system in terms of a Unix shell. So if I wanted to extract from this, like what an actual set of underlying protocols would be that actually, like what are the abstractions that make this work? Like POSIX for the cloud? Kinda, I mean, I think it's, you know, list, LS works because there's some abstraction under the hood that allows you to enumerate things, right? Like, yes, technically, tail, there's not a separate like stream primitive inside of POSIX. Like, you can just open something and read it, then you could stream it. But for cloud native resources, that's actually not necessarily the case. In many cases, it's a different operation whether you want to read the total output of something or whether you want to open a stream and leave it open. Um, which, you know, it's more advanced now. POSIX was a while ago, so this is kind of interesting. Reading stuff. Kind of important. Getting metadata for things is kind of like an equivalent. That's what powers stat, being able to have a notion of deleting stuff and execing things. So I thought, you know, what if we could build a set of abstractions on top of cloud native resources uh, that are these? Like, if we did that, 
what kind of tools would that actually let us build, right? So because I've been spending all this time kind of thinking about shell-like equivalents, that led me to think, well, I mean, shit, if I had all those abstractions and capabilities, could you actually build a shell that used all of those and presented those like that kind of user interface? And if you did, what would it look like? Would it work? Like, would it be janky because it's talking to stuff over the wire? Uh, so of course, like any good engineer, we just decided to do it <laughs> and build it and see what would happen. Um, so we've been working on this for, I don't know, maybe a couple of months, a small crew of folks, I think, just trying to experiment with the idea and see like, does this actually make any sense? So we built the tool, we call it WASH, the wide area shell. Um, you know, we were also Firefly fans, so you know, rest in peace, WASH. Sorry, spoilers, I guess, for that like 15-year-old television show. <laughs> but, um, so let's actually try it and see what that would look like. Um, let me mirror my display here again. All right, can people see this? More or less? Crayola mode, full Crayola mode. Clear, see, I just typed it. I wasn't even thinking about it. That's like the muscle memory. Okay, so you start it up, it's a shell, right? Like it looks like a shell, it behaves like a shell. It has help, like a shell would have help. Um, under the hood, it's doing some weird stuff, but I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, so what do I have? By default, we ship a couple of plugins that supports like kind of the basic stuff, and I'll talk a little bit about the extension mechanism a little bit later. Uh, but that's kind of the basics. So let's say I wanted to think about what is going on with Docker. So I would CD into it. What would you expect if I LS this? I don't know. Let's find out. Okay, I've got containers and volumes. What containers do I have? Oh, I could list them all. What am I not doing? I am not running docker ps dash dash all. I'm not doing any of this like insane crazy stuff. I can go into volumes. What volumes do I have? I'm using the same shell commands and I'm getting the same stuff because it turns out if you just implement like a list abstraction on top of things, you could use the same command to list things. So if I go back into containers, let's say I'll pick one. Oh, um, let's do uh, metadata on, I don't know, this Postgres container. Okay, so this is the actual like Docker metadata that I can get. Because I know the kinds of things there are here, we wrote a, uh, an equivalent of tree that basically says like, yep, these are all the objects, these are the types of them underneath. Uh, and once you know the types of all these things, I could start doing some interesting stuff. Like, um, let me go up a level where there were containers and volumes. Let's say I want to do find dot, I don't know, kind is a container. Okay, they're all my containers. Because we have metadata, um, let's see. We have a distinction in our find for meta versus full meta. Full, sometimes it's expensive to get the full metadata on something, so we made it optional. 2019 sucks, and you can actually get charged depending on how much metadata you read off of something. So, you know. Exactly. Um, so, let's see. You can do that, and then let's say I just want to find the things where the state. Uh, status is running. There you go. So there's three of them. Um, and that is, and then let's say I want to exargs, let's say I want to run a command on them. So um, wash exec, I don't know, uh, uname dash a. There you go. Okay. So I have three running containers. I just ran a command in all of them. But the interesting thing is if I go up to the top, Let's say I go into Kubernetes. Okay, I've got my GKE project here. Also, I didn't realize Docker for Desktop just creates a bunch of Kubernetes like contexts and volumes, which is kind of cool. Again, if you have an exploratory interactive system, you can kind of find this nifty shit about all the stuff that you've got that operates under the hood that's kind of interesting. Um, so let's say I want to go into my default namespace. I've got a bunch of pods here. Let's see what I have. Max depth to got a bunch of volume claims, I've got a bunch of pods, I set up in my GKE account like an Elasticsearch cluster and a GitLab cluster just to see what's going on here. I can go into these, I can do a lot of the same things that I was doing before. Um, so some of those examples that I listed were kind of interesting. So let's say I wanna go into Postgres container that I had. So there's a couple of interesting things on here. I could tail the log, I could 
tail dash F it if I really wanted to, and that would just connect to the Docker streaming API, which we've also implemented for all the other cloud native resources that support a streaming kind of interface. Notice there's an FS directory underneath it. Uh, so rather than making you figure out like what 18 commands you got to run and stitch together in order to get access to a container file system, we just did all that for you under the hood to implement list on a container, right? Because I mean, why not? It's a composite object that's got stuff inside of it. So if I go in here and I list it, I can actually see the file system. Like, I don't know, what's going on? What's going on inside this po crazy Postgres container? Um, you know, let's see, I can see things. Because this is all running on my local system, I could use like, you know, local commands on the container stuff. So like I could do a checksum on it. That checksum executable exists on my laptop, but I'm running it within the context of the container, which is kind of interesting because it's all surfaced via the file system, which I think is kind of, a, you know, that's sort of a novel thing, I suppose. So anyway, hopefully you get the idea, like uh, you can cat stuff, read stuff, CD around, explore. And once you can do these things, you can now start uh, using the same commands across multiple targets. Like if I wanted to, because of network connectivity being a little bit uh, slow and spotty, uh, I could go to the root and I could say, find everything across all the clouds that is of kind container, and then give me metadata on it. And I could do that in parallel because I don't have to write it in parallel. Xargs has the dash capital P command that'll just do stuff in parallel, which is kind of nice. I don't have to reinvent it. So suddenly I can now have composable operations for things where because they were normally restricted to vendor specific tools, it was really hard to compose tools from two different vendors to do something as a composite thing that's a little bit higher, right? Which is kind of nice. Once we got shells in the Unix world, people could start writing shell scripts. People could start sharing behavior because it was a standardized set of interfaces that you could build higher tools on top of. So that is the, that's the demo. And it's probably easier if you can, I mean, you could just try it. All right. So why a shell, I think? Uh, First of all, I think shells are pretty dope. Like they're, they're awesome. And I've seen a lot of talks today. Like they've been pretty excellent. Like there was one this morning on Codefresh and CI and they were trying to get the logs for different parts of a CI pipeline. And it was like eight clicks in the Codefresh UI, which looks really good. But I'm like, why can't I just like CD into Codefresh and then do an LS and get all of my pipelines and then go into the pipeline and see all my steps and then tail one of the steps and then just see that in my terminal window. Like, why do I have to click? When, like, why do, why do I have to click is really all I'm saying. It is 2019. We have mastered, like, why can't I use my 30-year-old technology and standards in order to be able to interact with something more programmatically in a quicker way that I would like? Plus, shells give you all kinds of interesting things. Like, just the demo that I was showing you, you, you it probably didn't break your brain to think about, like, oh, there's a top-level directory for Kubernetes. I could kind of guess what's under it. And if I don't know, you can just CD into it and check it out, right? Shells are really powerful because they can give you hierarchical structure and they give you sort of uh, navigational context for things that you don't necessarily get if all you're thinking about is I just have a cluster of stuff. Like, what do I do? But under the hood, we cheat. Uh, because obviously I am not literally going to write a shell from scratch. So actually the shell that that thing was powered by is just, I was just using ZSH. We also support bash for the moment, but if you have a shell of choice you would like, you can load that up. And we kind of fake it out by creating a bunch of different like shell aliases and functions to, you know, kind of remap a lot of the standard things like LS and tail and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, the abstraction is a bit leaky, but again, I'm not replacing any of the vendor specific tools. If you want to run AWS CLI, blah, 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 like you totally can, and it would, it would still work. Um, but by going through our system, it allows us to, you know, cache a bunch of stuff. We can keep a lot of state to keep a lot of these remote calls really quick. Uh, we don't have to make them repeatedly because we've already downloaded a lot of the information. So there's a lot of interesting stuff that you could do if you have a shell. Uh, internally, it's actually implemented. There's a server component that kind of runs in the background that's built on top of libfuse, which allows us to not have our own shell but still do file systemy things. In the future, people have definitely talked to us about like, well, what if you did just write your own shell? Like, then you wouldn't need to use fuse, right? Like, you could actually do potentially more interesting non POSIXy things, which kind of makes sense in a cloud native role when you're not talking about POSIX resources, right? So that's a lot of work, but it is definitely doable. Um, and under the, so, you know, that server is, exposes uh, every single command that I typed. 
uh, actually ends up in a like HTTP, like an API call to the underlying server. So if you wanted to just have that server running as some sort of abstraction layer across all your cloud infra and have a completely different front end driving it, like, I don't know, a Slack bot or Grant Shipley this morning had a video game hooked up to Kubernetes, you know, like you could easily hook that up to this and start deleting things, you know, that maybe you probably shouldn't, but you definitely could. Then we have the shell veneer on top of that if you want an interactive user experience. And then we've implemented a number of commands. That's not all of them, but uh, that's a large number of the ones that we've actually implemented. Um, signal is the most recent one. We had a lot of people that were like, hey, you should do delete. Like you should make RM work, oh, which I forgot to put up there because we did that. And I was like, yeah, why do you want RM? And they're like, oh, so if I have EC2 instances or something, you could just delete it. And I'm like, oh, that's not so hard. And I start coding it up and I'm like, oh shit. Wait a minute, like if you RM an EC2 instances, if you RM an EC2 instance, what should that do? Should it stop it? Should it terminate it? <laughs> like those are two different things for Amazon, right? Like you could stop something but not get rid of it and you could start it again. But if you terminate it, it can actually destroy it and you'd have to completely recreate it from scratch. But that got me thinking like, you know, one nice thing about POSIX is you can send signals to things and it's sort of arbitrarily defined behavior by the program that receives the signal, what they want to do with it. And then I thought, you know, a bunch of cloud native resources have all kinds of different signals that they could in theory respond to, right? Like I could have something that responds to like a flush or a restart or a reload config or whatever it is. It would be cool. So we're gonna, we've implemented the plumbing for signal and we're probably gonna implement some like wash kill, you know, the equivalent command where you can say, only because it's 2019, I don't have to be limited by the like 16 or 32 total signals that POSIX defines. And instead we can make it like an arbitrary number. So you could say like, we have a couple of hard coded in there, like start, stop, et cetera, things that kind of make sense, but people can add their own. The plugin mechanism, uh, there's two. You could write internal plugins. Wash is entirely implemented in Go, so if you wanted to do it that way, you definitely can. But there's also an external plugin mechanism, which far more people have used, which is you just tell Wash, here's the path to an executable, and then whenever anyone does like a shell operation, call my executable with the arguments, right? So your executable will get like your script, ls, here's the path, here's whatever args there are on it, right? Um, and that makes it really easy to actually tie this in, like put a file system -y kind of interface on top of kind of arbitrary stuff. So I think what we eventually realized is what we inadvertently ended up building that we initially targeted at cloud native resources specifically, ended up actually being a pretty interesting, completely pluggable like file system front end, right? Um, like if you've ever tried to write something against Fuse raw, like it sort of sucks and it's a big pain in the ass. So in a weird way, we've ended up building sort of a fuse on top of fuse that makes it a lot easier for people to have a file system interface to anything that they want, which people have definitely done. Um, folks have written all kinds of interesting stuff on top of this so far. Uh, this lady wrote like integration into AWS IoT stuff in order to talk to all like her company's devices. Uh, someone wrote a plugin to talk to the GitHub API directly because they found it was easier to just use ls and grep across their org's repos than it was to use the GitHub search interface, which after trying it, I totally agree with because the search interface is not super great, especially if you have a big org. Uh, someone wrote an API, someone wrote a plugin into Goodreads so they could like CD into like their reading list and just start catting stuff and watching it and watching their friends. So whenever they, you know, someone else read something, they would just get a notification in their terminal. Um, and people have done all kinds of stuff. They've written plugins for Bitbar that'll just do like, how many containers do I have? That's just a find dot dash K container pipe to WC. And you could put that in your taskbar window, right? And that'll work across anything, which is kind of great. Uh, and the one I wrote at home uh, connects to all my, my overly complicated home Wi-Fi setup, which has no reason being as complicated as it is, but like, I'm an idiot, so that's just what I did. So I have a bunch of router OS devices, so I wrote a Wash plugin that just goes out to them. It can get all the logs for them, so if anything is weird, I can just tail them all in like a terminal window, and I don't have to go through their dumb, like super specific uh, vendor web UI for a router, which are all terrible, right? Um, so, you know, give it a shot and try it out, I think. Contributions are definitely welcome. If you have any external plugin ideas, we would absolutely love that. If you have any thoughts on how to taxonomize, or I'll put it this way, if you're a Unixy gearhead and you got opinions about how a thing should be represented in a file system -y way, like 
like you're my people. <laughs> I want to hear about that because the entire taxonomy has been driven by the user community, like being super opinionated, sometimes to an excessive degree about how exactly these things should look. What should be, can you LS a container? What should it look like if you CD into it? How many files are there? Like, so you could have a lot of debates, but the important thing is that uh, the tool actually could work in that way. So download it, give it a shot, uh, come find me and yell at me about it. Other than that, that's all I got. Classic tools for the cloud native era. Thank you. Yeah. Um, how feasible is it to live in the shell? Like, can I get to my root file system? Can I? Um... Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you can. Let's see. Like, how does Sorry. them and Tmux run? Does it run within? I mean, how, oh yeah. Kind of stuff yep. So um, the shell, it's just a regular shell. So I could kind of run whatever I want in it. Like, I don't know, I could ping google.com and then it just does it. It has access to my local path. The magic is really just like the prompt is kind of swizzled. Uh, so if I actually just CD to my home directory, that's not actually the same as the wash root directory. Okay, so we haven't. That's, special, that's how you get in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's just for now, right? Like, there's probably other tricks we could do to obscure it, but. So from a, from then a bash script, can I reference thing, or how do I, or does it have to be in the wash? Yeah, it would have to be, uh, yeah. Shebang, wash. You would have to, yeah, you would have to use this as a shebang, okay. I think. And there's probably a number of places in which the abstractions would break for the shell layer. Most notably, I think, would be the things that we've aliased instead of making actual shell functions for them. Because in alias, you can't always reference the same way inside of a shell context as you can an actual shell function, yeah. uh, which is, you know. But you know, if I wanted to, I could you know, crack open an editor. And we do that all the time. Like We'll get a log file, and we'll just pipe that into some other tool, like grep or jq or vim or whatever it is. And that works totally fine. So yeah. Any other questions? I'll be around. Awesome, thank you very much.